good evening, and we welcome you to our Lord's Day evening worship service. Grateful that you've gathered with us tonight as we close out the Lord's Day together. Welcome those of you who are joining us online, as well as visitors. Certainly welcome to all of you. A privilege of having Mr. Tom Ellis with us this evening from Greenville Seminary, the evening preacher today. May have something to do with that, but welcome him. And of course, Jim and, and two students from the seminary. And then Jim and Janelle, welcome back. Grateful that you've rejoined us this evening. No announcements other than those greetings. So brothers, sisters, let us worship the Lord tonight. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that we can gather together tonight in Jesus' name and worship you. We thank you that we have the privilege of calling upon your name and bowing before you and enjoying your presence. Again, we ask you that you would forgive us of our sin. We have no right to be in your presence apart from the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we saw this morning in Psalm 50, you, you summon us, yet on our own we cannot survive the judgment. And through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, therefore, we are forgiven of formalism and hypocrisy and all of our other sins. So we thank you for that. Pray that we would draw near to you tonight with hearts full of faith and the desire to worship you and especially to hear your word. And we do pray for the folks on our prayer list. We think of those who continue to stand in need. Again, we think of Sam McAllister as he's going through these cancer treatments. Thank you that he's known some mercies in past days. We pray those would increase. Thank you especially for his desire to glorify you and him leaning on your mercies during this time and using each day to serve you best he can. Pray for Patricia Brooks Gaylord and Carl Robbins continuing his treatments while serving as a pastor. We pray for the other pastors that are stepping in to help him in this time. Think of Marty Richards and Alicia Terhar, and Peter Bennett and Cindy Bishop, folks that are known ultimately to you. You are their creator and yet connected in some way with our church. So we ask for them to know the mercies of the Lord. Pray that you would heal them. Pray that you would strengthen them, that they would call on you and walk with you. And now, Lord, as Dale comes in a moment to preach your word, we do pray uh, that we would, again, listen to your word and that we would be not merely hearers, but doers also. Fill him with your spirit and bless us as we hear your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> get to heaven, it will be a great day of rejoicing. Thank you for that. If you'll please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 17. We'll be looking at verses 6 to 13. This is a passage that we have visited once before. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago when we, or rather a month ago or so, when we considered this passage previously. And just to catch you up to speed then, what we're dealing with here is the Lord's high priestly prayer. It's, as I've called it, the second Lord's prayer. 
And in that, he models for us what it is to pray, uh, had how to have the tenderness, the love, and the care for his people and for others, even as we pray, and to pray rightly, even. When we considered that passage previously, we noted in, the, in Christ's first petition, the first petition of this prayer, of the of redemption accomplished and applied. And what is it? That we have eternal life, that we might know him, the one and only true God, and in Jesus Christ our Lord. And in this passage, in verses 6 to 13, we turn then to the first petition that Christ makes or on behalf of his disciples. He makes two. The first being here in verses 6 to 13. The second in verses 14 to 19. And then he makes two petitions in verses 20 to 23 for the church of all ages that come forth from them. And then in 24 to 26 as well. Uh, really the whole passage is a unit uh, coming at the end of a discourse in which the uh, Lord himself is at the end of his earthly ministry and is about to be arrested and sent into uh, sent up to be crucified and leaving his people. And that is cognizant throughout on his mind throughout the prayer. And so we'll see in this main passage, I'm going to read it bit by bit as we walk through it. So I won't read it now, uh, but really the main theme of this passage in verses 6 to 13 is that God will keep his people from falling away throughout all the ages. And this is developed under three different headings and Christ keeps you in truth, Christ keeps you in prayer, and then Christ keeps you in him. Let's pray for God's blessing once more. Our most gracious and merciful God, we thank you for bringing us here today, knowing that many in the world cannot, and even in this country, cannot and are not gathering together to worship you, to hear the preaching of the word. Lord, I pray that you will use this time as a time of great blessing for us all, even for myself. Lord, help us, teach us what you would have us to know. And I pray that you will, by your spirit, illumine our hearts and our minds to those things which you will have us to know to grow closer to you and more sure in our walks. We ask this in the name and for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. History is cyclical. In fact, there's really nothing in this world that ought to catch you by surprise. We think that maybe in our day in which there's a great deal of chaos in the world is perhaps new. Uh, in fact, it isn't new at all. And this is not, through the church of all the ages, Christ has promised us that we would have a great measure, a great deal of tribulation. For 2,000 years, that has been the case of the church. Dovetailing at the end of this passage in chapter 16, verse 33, he says, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so it is that we endure and are enabled to endure by his spirit. And how are we able to do this? Christ keeps us first in the truth. Let's look at verse 6 to 8. He says, I have manifested your name to men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. There's a number of things that you need to know from this passage. Beginning, first of all, and if Christ is going to keep you in the truth, how does he do this? He manifests this to you in his Son. He manifests your name, the name of the glory of God. In the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, he does this. Christ himself, becoming the, the incarnation, the God-man in the flesh, is the personification, the real message of that which he came to proclaim in the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's, who's he doing this to? He's doing this to those whom the Father has given him out of the world. He notes in verse 6 that they were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. This, what does this language mean? If you have 
given me them out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. What's this language mean? A couple of weeks ago at the Spring Theology Conference at Greenville Seminary that was held at Woodruff Road, uh, there was one talk in particular that I particularly enjoyed that uh, by John Fesco in which he dealt with the covenant of redemption. And without going into too much detail in it, it basically means that those whom God, whom Christ would redeem in time and space and eternity, God elected as a people for himself. And these are the people that Christ comes to redeem and to save. And we see this played out, I think, very well in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. That was before the foundation of the world that you were chosen in love to be his, to be his own. And so that's really the, the same sense of the passage that we had before us, that in eternity past you were his. This great work of election that the Father decrees in eternity, that the Son uh, participate or actually accomplishes in time and in space, and that the Spirit secures and applies these benefits to us in time and in space. So this is the great work of the Trinitarian God. And insofar Christ is concerned... This decree in his own work and words is an accomplishment of this redemption. When Christ says in the latter verse, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word, we see clearly that he has his disciples in mind. I mentioned at the beginning that his disciples were on his mind because in verses 6 to 13 that, and following in 19, that's who he has on his mind. But what's he say? They say they kept your word, and that's pretty startling because... When you look at the whole history of Christ's life, his apostles oftentimes uh, did not really, were not always fully awake or aware of who he was. He even says to Peter, uh, when Peter says that, I, uh, that you are the one true and living God, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Uh, he even said, when he says that they kept the word, you have to imagine, well, did they keep the word when they ran away from him in the garden? Of course they did. They didn't have a perfect knowledge, but they had enough knowledge to know who he was. And they've kept it. They've known me. Now, William Hendrickson notes in his commentary that this word known here is the same type of knowledge that we're to have that Christ mentions in verse 3. It's a true and experiential knowledge. That's what they have, and that's what we are to have as well. For I have given, he says, for I have given to them the words which you have received, which you have given me. The great glory of the gospel, of the truth of the word of God, is what has been given to them and has been received. It has been taken hold of by them. They've known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. In other words, they trust the things that he said. They trust that this word has been come forth from the Father. And how is this so? Well, they know this because the Spirit has illuminated these, mind, these truths to them, even as he illuminates our, the, these truths to our minds. In truth, this is not so for many of the people in this world. We look forward in verses 9 to 10, where under that he keeps us in prayer. So he keeps us in the truth, and so he keeps us in prayer. He says I, in verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours, and all are mine, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. When you come to that passage, you ought to startle. It ought to cause you to stop for a moment. Because there are two people here, types of people here that are being presented. On the one hand, you have those whom Christ prays for and he's interceding for, and those whom he isn't. People that he's just described in verses 6 to 8 are the ones he's interceding for, the ones whom he's praying for, the one who's he's praying that their faith may not fail. And then there are those in verses, in the same verse, he says, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. These are the people that we are having to live among, that we're having to live with. And it should break your hearts and minds to know that there are people that will never know this true and great intercessory work that we are able to partake of, or to at least experience, or to know. John MacArthur, in his sermon, I, which I thought was quite masterful, actually, this past week at the Ligonier Conference, 
I think, sets this up in a very remarkable way. The world that we're being left in indeed is a wicked world. There's chaos reigning among the world. There's chaos reigning among those whom hate Christ, whom he has not saved, whom he has not purchased, who he's not redeemed. He doesn't pray for them. He's, in this sense, giving them over to their own devices. He's giving them over to judgment. And what happens when he gives them over to judgment? Let's look in in Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, and became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible men, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to their uncleanness, to uncleanness and their lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You want to know if this world is is, uh, going into chaos? Yeah, it's going into chaos. You want to know if this world is under judgment? This world is under judgment. Christ is not praying for them to persevere because he's already given them over. John MacArthur even said he asked, somebody asked him, was this world going to have judgment to come? No, it's already here. It's already here because people have chosen, those who have chosen exactly what they wanted, and it is not God. They've hated him. They've reviled him. They spit in his face and say, as they, as he, uh, they say in Isaiah 5, he's mocking him, calling him the Holy One of Israel, and they say, He's the Holy One of Israel. Let him just come and stop us. He doesn't pray for them. He's given them over to that. And the world itself is ever on the attack against the people of God. They hate the people of God. Throughout all the ages we even see in, in the early Roman period, or at least in the early period with uh, Emperor Nero where they were persecuted mercilessly. Throughout 2,000 years of church history, this is true. And no more different than it is now. And this is the world that Christ is leaving us in. Not maliciously. Certainly that we are not going where he, we are going to where he is, just not now. But he prays for us knowing that in this world, we, our faith will fail. Indeed, it often does. And he's asking that our faith may be, may be kept. And it's this mutual interest then in verse 10 that we see. He says, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Just as much then as I see it, just as much as he is glorified in sinners redeemed, he is also glorified in the unrighteous to be judged. God will have the glory, both in the righteous redeemed, those whom he has called to be redeemed, and those whom he has called to judge will be judged. Third, then, in verse 11, he says, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the, in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. 
Again, Christ is cognizant of the fact in verse 11 that he is about to leave the people in this world, his people, his disciples in this world to carry on the mission that they are about to do. And he says this, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. In other words, he's asking the Father whom he is giving to them to keep them, to guard them, that their faith may not fail. Uh, dear friends, if you have ex been in this world long enough, you know how hard it is to live Christianly. You know that in this world where the world is telling you one thing, say that the measure of success is in being great when Christ says it's to be small, when he humbles the proud and exalts the humble, certainly the foolishness of, of this is, be, is before, ever before us because the world says that it is so foolish. And yet and the pressures to conform, the pressures to compromise, the pressures to give in to what the world says is exactly before him when he says, Father, guard them, really keep, keep them or guard them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Not in this sort of, you know, one big denomination, one big universal church that we might be one, but really that we might be one in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, having been united to him, having been baptized into that one baptism and that one faith of this one true Christ. And you wonder then, what can separate us from him? Can there be anything that separates us from the love of God? Think again. Look in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we, he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Intercession. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the answer to the question then, no, nothing. Can separate you from him. Why? Because you're safe in the Redeemer's hands. While I was with them in the world, he says in verse 12, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Again, reiterating that, that those whom the Father has given him, he has kept, he has guarded, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. Who's he referring to? He's referring to Judas. He's, I think he's really think he's referring to Judas because, let's look at it, what does Judas do? He betrays him. He delivers him over to the authorities. He even betrays him with a kiss. He shows that, yeah, he knows who Christ is, but he doesn't give true knowledge to him. He rejects him, even to kill him. And oh, woe is that person that should, be de should deliver the Savior up to death, as Judas did. But the scripture says it's to be fulfilled. Now what's this tension then? There is a tension, tension here. It's a tension on the one hand that he says in verse 12, those you have, whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. Was Judas ever one of Christ's? Well, if we look at First John and First John, those who went out from us were never even of us. And so is that not also true for Judas then? Of course it is. Judas certainly knew Christ. He walked with him. He ate with him. But when push came to shove, he turned away and delivered him to be killed. Friends, there are many people in this world who will do the very same thing. 
There will be people who will give assent, who will give some sort of knowledge, who will give some sort of verbal assent to the Lord Jesus, and will, will in the final day, when push comes to shove, will reject the Savior. And is that not so much so that you need to be guarding yourselves against that as well? Do you have true knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Do you see him for as he is as the magnificent Savior, the one who came to redeem a people for himself, and that even though he leaves us in this world, that he will keep us, that he will guard us? That your faith may not fail? Yes, he knows it's weak. Yes, he knows that the trials and the tribulations of this life will certainly tear us down and say, Oh Lord, how long will it take for you to come? We've certainly experienced that in the last year with the absolute utter chaos that is ever before us. But I haven't lost any you have given me. And that in that we know that the, even though the son of perdition certainly did give Christ up, we do know this fact is true. That the scriptures were fulfilled. And what does that mean then? It just simply means this. That even though Judas did betray him, and he lost none. We can rest in the knowledge that his plans will never be thwarted for his people. Judas was one of those vessels that were held up for dishonor and destruction that Paul refers to in Romans chapter 9. And that in that God is still glorified. He's glorified in as much as their, as their destruction as he is in our redemption. In verse 13 he says again, but now I come to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I mentioned throughout, really, that the mind of Christ is always, at least in this prayer, is that he is about to leave this world. But he adds something to this that is important. That they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. Well, what is the nature of this joy? They're about to be... Sheep sent among the wolves. They're about to be people that are experiencing tribulation as is such as never been experienced before in this world, at least for the people of God. They're going to be delivered to the carnage and, and, and persecution, and, and in many ways, most Christians will not die in the happy and cozy homes that we're so accustomed to here now, even though that is a great blessing that we can. <coughs> So what's the nature of this joy then? It's a joy. The reality of a task as accomplished, certainly to be accomplished. And that in that we live with the expectancy of Christ's second coming, of his joyous second coming. And so that even while we are here now. There will be one day where that faith is made sight, that weak faith, that trembling faith. It may not be as strong as we would like it to be. It will certainly be weaker than we would have it be. But one day when Christ comes again, coming through those great clouds of glory, that he will manifest himself as the glorious God and King, and bringing all his enemies under his footstool, and so declare himself before all that he is both Lord and Christ, and deliver his people, and in that he will give them rest. So do we rejoice in this? Do we rejoice in the knowledge that he is keeping us in the faith, strengthening us when we are weak, and enlivening us when we are in despair? Do we live in the eager expectation that though he lives or that though he leaves, he will return. Do we have the vision that for our lives, we can commit them wholly to his service, come what may, knowing that we are safe in the Redeemer's hands? These truths ought to present for us something of a spiritual gut check, I think. And here's the reason why. As we see throughout the rest of the passage and. In verse 14 of this very chapter, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The world hates them. What's he saying then? What should be our concern? Should we be merely trying to harmonize with the world, trying to syncretize with what they would have us say, do and believe so that we might be more conformable to what they want 
to a Christ that really is no Christ, to a gospel that really is no gospel? Do we secretize what they want to make it more palatable? No. How much more so do we not even, should we principally be concerning our things with those heavenly realities instead of these temporal ones? That doesn't mean then that we need to be another worldly people completely unconcerned with, with what happens now. In the Great Commission passage, that's clearly untrue. We should be concerned with what happens in this world. But the reality is, at the same time, that the world will have its way. And that we as the people of God, as we persevere in the, spirit, in the faith, enabled by the Spirit, must do so by living faithfully. And that's really what we should take away from here, is that we need to be in this world living faithfully. And how do we live faithfully? First of all, we need to commit ourselves to the means of grace. We need to be committing ourselves to preaching, to prayer, to the sacraments. Why? Because how are we going to grow in this world? We're not going to be growing by what we see, by whatever platform we seek to advance for this secular world. We're not going to grow by being upset at the world doing what the world is going to do, even though there are many things that certainly should drive us to tears. But as we submit ourselves to the preaching of the word, to prayer, to the sacraments, we are leaving to live quietly and humbly, not living unpeaceably, but living peaceably with our neighbors insofar as we are able. But also we should live in communion one with another. One of the benefits of the communion of the saints is that we get together like this every Lord's Day. To build one another up, certainly to sharpen one another in the faith. And in a world where the love has grown, where love has grown cold, where certainly they're not gonna, the world's not gonna encourage you to live righteously, to do those things which God has called you to do and who God has called you to be. Certainly the world will not do that, but in the communion of the saints and our fellowship one with another on the Lord's Day. Again, as we submit to, the, to these means of grace that we have here, we live more and more to build one another up in the faith. And even then, we know that Christ himself is perfecting us. He's making us more like himself in the end of the day. So dear Christian, even though as our weight, faith may be weak, we come here each day to be built up. Christ is our king, leads us on, he keeps us, he guards us, so that we and our faith may not fail. As we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these truths that you have given to us here in your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will edify some, and will certainly keep us grounded on the rock that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Teach us, we pray, to live more and more with that sight, the sight of that blessed hope that we have in Christ's glorious second coming. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will help us to live knowing that this world is not our home. And as we live, we live joyously, patiently, humbly, quietly, but all to your glory. We ask this in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ.